ideally. 30 seconds. <laughs> Fifteen seconds. <laughs> you can stop the poll there. That was just. We all, we already have um, over a hundred people on the line. So this is just to give us a test of of how you all are are, are um, understanding the ideas about emergency contraception. Before I start or even introduce myself, I'm going to ask my colleague Yassine to explain to our French speakers on the line um, a little how the translation works. I want to make sure everybody's not, um, isn't missing anything. Go ahead, Yassine. Yassine, I can't hear you. I don't know if others can. Yassine? Hello. Hi, Yassine. Would you mind go ahead and explaining to our French speakers um, how to use the translation, just in case they've not understood? Definitely. Um, le webinar sera en anglais, mais il aura une interprétation en français. Avant de commencer le webinar, chacun doit choisir une option linguistique. Regardez en bas de votre écran Zoom et trouvez l'icône de Globe Terrestre qui indique interprétation. Sélectionnez votre langue préférée, l'anglais ou le français. Si vous choisissez le français, vous pouvez couper le son original si vous ne voulez pas entendre la narration en anglais. Si vous êtes sur un appareil mobile Android ou Apple, appuyez sur les trois points. Ensuite, appuyez sur l'interprétation linguistique pour anglais ou français. Si vous avez des questions à ce sujet, n'hésitez pas à me poser les questions dans la boîte de discussion. Merci. That's really great. So now that we have everyone on the right channel, um, we want to make sure that everyone's um, with their preferred channel. So if you like to hear me in English, stay where you are. Okay, so today um, I want to welcome you all to the webinar on emergency contraception. It's really not a webinar, it's more of a chat show, discussion, live Q&A. And my name is Emily Sullivan and I'm the Adolescent and Youth Engagement Manager for Family Planning 2020. So before we dive into our chat show and our discussion, I wanted to share just a few logistical points with you. The first is that um, there's both a chat box, which many of you are introducing yourself in already from all amazing countries all over the world, but that's not where we want you to put questions. We want you to put your questions in the Q&A pod, which you'll find on the bottom. So if you have a question for any of our speakers today, Go ahead and pop, put it into the Q&A pod. If you have a comment or want to talk about what emergency contraception access looks like in your country, then you can stick to the chat box. As I mentioned, everything is in French and English. So if you're if you're a French speaker, feel free to put in your questions and your chats in your in your own language um, there, and we'll be sure to translate for for those who who can't understand. If you have technical difficulties. First, try the chat box. If that doesn't work, then you can email Yassine, who just um, shared with us um, how the translation works. Yassine's email is yvai at familyplanning2020.org. So you can email her if, if you have a serious issue that can't be resolved on the chat. And finally, um, this webinar is being recorded um, and we will be sharing it in French and in English following um, today along with the resources and other items that might be uh, mentioned or or, um, or discussed today. So no worries about having to take lots of notes. We're going to follow up with you. Great. So we don't um, have panelists today. We have speakers and mythbusters, as I'm calling them. And I myself, I'm the moderator. As I mentioned, I'm Emily Sullivan. We have Erickson Bernardo, who is a youth focal point in the Philippines for FP2020, but is also a representative of the Philippines Society for SRH Nurses. 
We have Dr. Jackie Nwong, who is a youth focal point from Cameroon, also the executive director of Youth to Youth and a practicing physician. We've got Sadia Rahman, who is our youth focal point from Bangladesh. Um, she's an active activist and advocate, as well as the previous, most immediate previous um, country coordinator for, for IYAFP Bangladesh. Um, we also have Tina Pujik. Right. Tell me before, Tina, I think I butchered it. You're going to have to introduce yourself again. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Tina is from the European Consortium on Emergency Contraception. And last but not least, we've got Wilson um, Lambila, who is from the Population Council in Kenya. And what's really great about this set of speakers and myth busters for emergency contraception is that we've got medical providers, we've got advocates, we've got researchers, and we've got communicators. And we know at FP2020, we need all of those things to succeed, especially on a, on a challenging topic like emergency contraception. So now we'll go ahead and take down the speaker slide and pop up everybody's beautiful faces. Um, and so these are our wonderful speakers um, today. Before we get started um, with the full on discussion, I want to do a little bit of a framing for us about why we're here, why we're talking about emergency contraception today. So first and foremost, I hope everybody on the call knows that young people have sex and it's not always by choice. Sometimes it is. And so we want to make sure that they have access to all the methods that they choose to use. However, in even a typical time, that's difficult for young people. In case you haven't noticed, we're not in typical times. We've got a global pandemic going on. And so what's already challenging for young people to do, which is access the method of contraception that is their choice. Um, now that's even more difficult because of the pandemic. This means that emergency contraception is really important. And so, but we know the realities of even asking, accessing EC right now is, is challenging for young people. So all that is why we're talking today, but there's also a really important additional point, which is I've noticed, I'm sure you've noticed, even the most seasoned advocates for family planning and sexual and reproductive health and rights really struggle to talk about emergency contraception. I've seen quite senior people fumble over a description or accidentally, hopefully not on purpose, stigmatize people who use emergency contraception. And so today, as fellow advocates for family planning and sexual and reproductive health and rights, I want us to really challenge ourselves about how we talk about emergency contraception and making sure we're not accidentally or even purposefully um, stigmatizing those who use con emergency contraception because that's the last thing we, we need to do, especially as advocates ourselves. So that's why we're here today, is to kind of challenge ourselves, break down some myths and misconceptions. Just a reminder to everyone on the line, feel free to uh, put your questions in the Q&A box and feel free to chat it up in the chat box while we're discussing. Great. So before we um, dive into some of the more action-oriented questions, all the questions today are based on submissions we received from approximately 50 plus young people all around the world. So the questions I'm going to ask are already things that young people have submitted previously, but we're also going to open it up to those who put questions in, in the Q&A pod. We're going to start off with four questions that are essentially baseline questions, basic questions, to make sure we're all operating from the same place. But as I mentioned, don't be um, feeling like you don't know enough if you feel like even these basic questions aren't so basic for you. Because as I mentioned, I've heard quite senior people fumble over explaining emergency contraception. So, we want to make sure we're all, all understanding the same thing. So Wilson, um, as a researcher on emergency contraception, I'm hoping you can kick us off. 
Um, can you explain to us what is emergency contraception and why is it important to access? Uh, thank you very much, Emily, and um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, as I was introduced earlier, um, my name is Liambila Wilson, and I'm a program associate with the Population Council in our Nairobi office. Uh, basically, emergency uh, contraception uh, re refers to to um, uh, the type of um, um, uh, <coughs> emergency meth um, um, reproductive health methods which can prevent pregnancy uh, following an uh, following unprotected sex and we we have different types of uh, contraception methods that are used for emergency uh, one of them is the dedicated uh, pills, what we call levonorgestrel or LNG. The brand name uh, in many countries you'll find is Postno 2 or Postno. Um, the, the other one is um, uh, Uliprosto Acetate or Ella 1 or Ella, simply Ella. Um, Ella is made in Africa is mainly found in Francophone um, countries. We, it's registered in 13 countries. Um, the, and it's also available in East Africa, for example, in Burundi uh, through import licenses. Um, the other method which can be used for emerg as emergency contraception is copper IUD. Um, Copper IUD has a different mode of action. Uh, basically, the copper ion creates um, some hostile environment within the uterine cavity, which then prevents uh, pregnancy. The, if those methods are not accessible, in some contexts, we encourage young people or whoever wants to use the method also to use the USB method. In other words, uh, the absence of dedicated methods or ELA or COPA IOD does not prevent one from using EC. They can still use the normal combined oral pills um, in different formulations when they, then it can help them to, to, for, um, to be used as emergency contraception. Um, and a little bit, I want just to clarify one thing that Emergency contraception on, it, on their own, they don't prevent STIs, HIV. So the your use of these methods is important, um, uh, using uh, condoms and all this, because on their own, emergency contraception will not prevent uh, one from getting STI, HIV. Um, though I had mentioned the COPA IOD, and I need just to because we are living in different times, COVID-19 has hit the world. Uh, it, it has disrupted our lives. And I, I just wanted to emphasize that uh, because of restriction in many countries between health providers, you, you require protective gears and all this. Uh, my own position is that perhaps I think for young people to access EC, I think over the counter ones, uh, LNG, Levonogestrel or ELA, uh, should be the most preferred other than the COPA uh, IUD. I'm saying COPA IUD is very, very effective, but given the context in which we are now, with, uh, in the context of COVID, that perhaps that uh, poses restrictions. Um, uh, right. it, it does pose restrictions, yeah. So in better times, Wilson, young people can opt for a copper IUD as a form of emergency contraception. But right now, the most common methods are, could you just repeat that again? What is most likely is over-the-counter? Yes, the, so the over-the-counter, the, the LNG, the levonorgestrel, over-the-counter, and they are known by different names in different countries. Right. Um, they may be P2s or personal two. In other countries, they have ELA or ELA-1. Great. Yes. Exactly. It seems like, Tina, you wanted to add something. I see you oh, trying yeah, to go for it. <laughs> so ELA and ELA-1 is for the, is the brand name for the Ulipristal uh, acetate formulation, right? And Postin or Norlevo, Escapel, there are as many mm -hmm. brands as you want. Uh, for the 11 orchestral product. Right. 
just don't worry if you don't understand the medical terminology. I don't have a medical degree. I don't know some of these, um, some of these uh, concepts as far as the actual ingredients, but essentially just to recognize that although copper ID has been approved for lung, for emergency contraception use, today we're mostly just gonna talk about the most typical form that, that's um, utilized in most countries. So we've discussed what EC is, and now Wilson, can you under, help us understand what emergency contraception is not? For instance, yeah. is it the abortion pill? Is it a, a more typical um, contraceptive pill that people use daily and get in monthly packs? What is EC not? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, um, Emily. The, the, so EC or emergency contraception um, is not, um, an abortion pill. Um, the, the the reason I'm emphasizing that, and you find from WHO guidelines and many of these uh, guidelines we have around, is that once pregnancy has occurred, uh, emergency contraception has no role in, uh, at all uh, in disrupting um, an established, an already established pregnancy. Um, Secondly, the mode of action uh, of emergency contraception is such that either, for example, for, when you look at levonorgestrel or even ELA, the, it, it, it either delays ovulation or it slows down the movement of uh, spermatozoa or over, over um, in the, the fallopian tubes. And so it, it doesn't in a way interfere with, so it's not an abortion uh, drug at all. Um, it's not, when you look at the mode of action, uh, how, how it works, so it is not, it is not um, uh, an abortion drug. Over to you, thank you. And a mode of action just means how it works, correct? Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, how it works. <laughs> just <laughs> breaking it down for those of us um, yes. that, that do not. Um, Thank you. Before, before we go any further, I just saw some people were having trouble hearing. And what you need to do is make sure at the bottom you choose the language you want to hear it in. You have to choose English if you speak English, choose French if you speak French. Those are the only two languages we have today. Um, but just want to make sure everyone can hear. Did Jackie or Eric or Sadio or Tina want to add to anything on the what EC is or EC is not, or or should I move on? Everybody looks satisfied. Okay, great. <laughs> so, so, Emily, just one point of clarification. Yes. Uh, yes. The, the the in terms of the medical eligibility criteria, uh, I mean, who? So the question is. Uh, and many people usually ask you this question all over the world is who can use EC emergency contraception? Right. So it's been categorized as MEC or medical eligibility criteria category one, meaning there's no restriction on who can use EC or emergency contraception. I just wanted to make it clear that so that we are on the same page. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Over to you. So the medical eligibility criteria is set by the World Health Organization, correct? And other, yes. and other, um, uh, medical associations endorse the medical eligibility criteria, and that means it's safe for young people to use. Exactly. Exactly. Great. And so our next um, question that's more in this sort of baseline setting, the basic getting started, is um, we know that in, in some places, emergency contraception use is restricted to only um, young people who are people who have experienced um, sexual abuse or violence or assault, is this the only instance when emergency contraception should be used or when can it be used? Um, this goes for me, right? Yeah, go for it, Tina. Yeah, uh, well, um, indeed, uh, emergency contraception should be provided as part of, of the first line treatment given to a woman who has been sexually assaulted if she, was, if she didn't have any contraceptive protection of her own. But this is not the only situation in which emergency contraception should be included. There are another three situations in which any woman of any age should consider using EC. If she had sex without using a method, 
because these things happen for whatever reason. Yeah. Whatever reason, it's none of our business. If um, if a method was used but uh, but not correctly, for instance, let's say a couple is using the fertility awareness method, but they fail to abstain around the dates that uh, they're supposed to abstain, which also happens. Um, in this case, emergency using emergency contraception would provide a backup to this couple's uh, contraceptive strategy, which is to use the fertility awareness rate. And in the last situation is if you use the method correctly, but immediately after using it, uh, you realize that uh, it failed. Like you use a condom, you wear it correctly, but it broke. It's still, uh, if you, well, if you miss taking a pill, it would be if you don't use it correctly. But these are like the three situations in which, you know, in which poses a woman at risk of pregnancy and where uh, emergency contraception provides a second chance to prevent that pregnancy. Um, um, emergency contraception can be used by women of any age, teenage, young women, adult women, um, as long as, well, you know, what we said, um, uh, she had unprotected sex and doesn't want to be pregnant. This is the criteria. Um, and, there, and as Wilson was saying, there is no different clinical recommendations for use depending on the age. Doesn't matter, age is never a factor. So it's, um, it's safe um, and appropriate for girls and women of any age to use emergency contraception. Um, and the only real requirement would be they've had unprotected sex for any reason that may have arisen um, and that that's where the line should be drawn. We know it's not, um, we know it tends to be more restrictive in countries around the world for a variety of reasons, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. We actually already covered the last basic question. I don't know if any of the others wanted to come in on the point about um, when EC should be used, but Tina covered it quite well. Mm -hmm. Okay. In that case, um, we're going to move on to what I'm calling a reality check. And the reality check is now that we have a basic understanding of what emergency contraception is and what emergency contraception is not, and that it's safe and appropriate for young people to use whenever they need it. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about with Eric and Jackie and Sadia about what does emergency contraception really look like in their home countries and in their communities. Um, so first, I wanted to ask Eric, Eric, you're a sexual and reproductive health nurse in the Philippines and the most commonly used method of emergency contraception, which Wilson explained, isn't available in the Philippines for anyone. Um, not just young people. Can you give us a sense of what the implications are of something like that, having such restricted use? Thank you, Emily. Uh, so for the Philippines, the Philippine Department of Health or the Ministry of Health has in its uh, Family Planning Clinical Standards Manual the use of USPE method uh, as part of uh, the interventions for sexually abused or sexually assaulted with uh, victim survivors of uh, violence. Unfortunately, uh, Plan B, uh, Nordet, and all the likes have been delisted in the Philippine National Drug Formulary uh, long, long before. So current implications for that one, uh, specifically for young people, unfortunately, we're seeing uh, a surge in the cases of teenage pregnancies. Uh, matter of fact, in one city in the southern part of the Philippines, we have less than a thousand uh, preteen and adolescent pregnancies just for the first quarter of 2020. Uh, and another thing, uh, although abortion is also illegal in the Philippines by all, uh, regardless of circumstances, in 2013, uh, Guttmacher Institute did a study on abortion cases in the Philippines and they have estimated that in 2012, there were almost 610,000 abortions, 100,000 of which uh, had to be brought to hospital for post-abortion complications and 
this unsafe abortion have resulted to a thousand deaths. So basically, uh, having no access to emergency contraception whatsoever in the Philippines, young people and uh, women who have, as Tina and Wilson mentioned, who have unprotected sex would either result to taking a uh, use by method or uh, result, result to having copper IUD inserted. So basically, there are uh, very much limitations for mm -hmm. women here in the Philippines. And so the so what you're saying is is when EC is restricted, then there's this ripple effect or domino effect, whatever you want to call it, um, that is really resulting in you know significantly changed lives, even possibly um, maternal mortality, um, yes. and so the implications are high. And I know many in the Philippines are really advocating for this to be a change. So um, thanks for all of your dedication and your dedication of all your colleagues to try to really take action on that. We want to hear more about what you're doing later on. Sure. Great. Over to you. Thanks, Eric. And so now we've got um, Dr. Jackie um, coming to us from Northwest Cameroon. And Jackie, you're really um, facing a double burden at in the at the moment of both the pandemic, which the world is struggling with, but then also um, some internal conflict, and both of those things make young people more vulnerable. Um, so, what does that mean um, for young people's access to something like emergency contraception? What are what's the experience like? Okay, uh, Emily, thanks for having me. So. Uh, like you said, the Northwest region of Cameroon is currently experiencing a double crisis. And one of the things, the repercussions that really stands out is the impact of the crisis on the sexual and reproductive health of, of young people. Who have shown up with unintended pregnancies. And but what I have also what I also noticed was that despite the fact that young people are really more young people are having unintended pregnancies, they see a lot of bias, they see a lot of misinformation about emergency contraceptive pills. I have had so many cases maybe after a young person presents with a complication from an unsafe abortion because abortion is not legalized in Cameroon. So they will, they will start the process in the neighborhood and then come to the facility later on. So after maybe the, the, the life of the young person has been stabilized and the, the patient is punished. Now, when you want to counsel properly and talk with the, the family members, because these young people are mostly accompanied by their parents or by their caretakers, and we're like, okay, this has happened. There is a need for these young people to, young person to access family planning. The immediate response you get that no, it can't happen. This person committed this mistake. Surely they are, she must have learned from her experience if we want to permit her to access a family planning method it means that we are encouraging her to be irresponsible. So talking about the need for better access to emergency contraceptive field is really a dying need for the youth in, in, in this community because mm -hmm. of the different obstacles that they have, which are at various levels, be it with healthcare providers, be it even with those who advocate for sexual reproductive healthcare rights of young people. These are mostly adults and they really have their biases that overshadow in their advocacy. So, but now everybody can see that there is a big problem because these teenagers are really coming up with, with pregnancies. Many of them have there's a steady increase in unintended pregnancies in the region. We have been discussing with different stakeholders and the stories are a bit alarming. But now, if there is a change that young people can access information, on biased information, emergency contraceptive pill, they know how to use it and when to use it, and that it's service providers, be it the local drug vendors, be it the pharmacies in the community or different health facilities, have these emergency contraceptive pills in stock and that the prices are affordable to these young people, 
The very first thing is that because in, uh, in Cameroon, there are studies that have been conducted which shows that young people really use the demand. They have a high demand comparatively to other, uh, to other family planning methods. Young people demand emergency contraceptive pills more. So right. if we have these barriers taken care of, means that young people are going to access emergency contraceptive pill. They are going to use it appropriately. And then unintended pregnancies are going to, to, to decrease. Also, these young people who, because now with the pandemic, at least these regions that the schools were really shut down in that region, but because of the pandemic, may, most schools are able to deliver studies now online, which means that these young people in our region who could not access schools can study from their home now because of the implementation of distance learning. But if they don't have other barriers like unintended pregnancy, they are going to continue with their education, which means that they are going to graduate from school, their health is going to be improved, uh, infant mortality is going to reduce, infant mortality right. are really going to reduce. So uh, we, we, we really think collectively with other colleagues that I've discussed with before, those who have the experience of what young people are going through in their sexual reproductive health. Access to emergency contraceptive pill is a dying need in, yeah. in our community and we're really looking forward to that. Thank you very much for sharing that that sharing that Dr. Jackie. I, I feel like it's important for, for everyone to understand that um, something that's that it's a layered complicated complications you've just mentioned. There's stigma, um, perhaps even a perception that girls have to experience a burden after after having unplanned um, pregnancy that they don't necessarily deserve access to EC for some reason. Um, and then it all kind of goes from there. Is it affordable? Can they access it? There are layers upon layers here. Um, and so it's really great to hear that it's you're able to, you know, improve access to accurate information and really work with pharmacies, pharmacists and others to try to break through some of those stigma. And we'll look to you a little later on to give us some additional action points. And so Sadia, um, you are in Bangladesh. We can't see you. I'm hoping you'll give us a chance to see you, see you um, if your internet allows. Oh, there you are, great. And so Sadia, I understand that in, in Bangladesh, um, one can access emergency contraception if they're married, correct? That's sort of the, the unique distincting, distinction um, that's a little different than from Eric's situation and Jackie's situation in in Philippines and in Cameroon, um, what do what do unmarried young people do, and what does restriction for unmarried young people mean? Actually, uh, emergency contraceptive is uh, easily available in Bangladesh uh, over the counters. Luckily, we don't need any prescription here. But there is a, um, a common law for uh, family planning um, services for unmarried young couples in Bangladesh. So they do not, and, uh, sorry, uh, unmarried adolescents, not couples, un un unmarried adolescents cannot access any services in Bangladesh. So um, luckily, uh, emergency contraceptive doesn't actually uh, require uh, service support that much. So uh, they can access it over the counter with, without any prescription. And uh, also, um, the uh, the accessibility i would say in urban areas is is much more than the rural area but there is stigma uh, uh, is there um, just like uh, eric and jackie said that um, it what bangladesh is a country where uh, uh, if a girl uh, or woman wants to buy their own sanitary napkins that's also stigmatized so it's a case of uh, emergency contraceptives, and and most in most cases, the it is the male partner who uh, goes to buy the EC for the female one. So the, the stigma is there. Also, the uh, in if we talk about the rural areas, the scenario is more difficult there because the uh, pharmacies in rural areas are far away from the home. So um, sometimes it's the only male person who have access to go to those markets and uh, buy uh, the ECs. But uh, in, uh, in those cases, the male person is also stigmatized. 
So uh, if that's a uh, new couple, newly married couple, they are actually shy to uh, have it over the counter. So the stigma is that also the price, uh, the pricing of the, um, there are only two brands in, uh, in Bangladesh and we import uh, other brands from um, foreign countries, but two, two brands are sometimes not affordable by uh, girls uh, who are not uh, in a state of uh, uh, income or maybe they are just teenagers and, and uh, so it's difficult for them to uh, buy sometimes and um, so they're left with if they uh, do not have any access to emergency contraceptions they, they do not have any uh, option left with they, uh, they are only left with one option of getting unwanted pregnancies and uh, I think if um, we we want to that's the general scenario and in the uh, uh, in this uh, in this uh, situation of covid 19 it get, got uh, more difficult because it's locked down here so um people are not going out without any emergencies and uh, and uh, other uh, time planning services are uh, actually hard to reach right now so right. Uh, the emergency right. contraception is is uh, the, something that's uh, really uh, easy to access so like uh, near to for near pharmacies or to home mm -hmm. but there are another uh, challenge that um, in bangladesh mostly in rural areas I, um, but in urban areas the scenario is more or less good people know how to use ec and maybe they know that it's safe for their um, health it doesn't um, there are misconception uh, about it that it it, it don't allow you to get pregnant in future so that uh, the conception is changing but not that much and also there are service providers uh, buyers as well there are uh, sure. many service providers who actually discourage to use emergency contraceptives and saying that uh, it will uh, uh, increase the difficulty of a woman's body to get pregnant in future so uh, that's that's one case, and another is um, there are examples in Bangladesh where a um, married couple uh, goes to a service provider, and service provider gives them the oral pills to have, and a uh, month later the couple comes and says, "Oh, my husband takes this pill every day, but I still got pregnant." So, so this is a scenario with the uh, regular contraceptive pills. So in I'm, I'm really uh, concerned uh, about rural areas that they do not know actually the use of EC, that it has to be taken as soon as possible. Also, there are evidences that it works uh, uh, right. uh, even if taken before the intercourse, but I'm not sure if it's circulated already or not. But the 72 hours rule is not that much familiar in rural areas and also um, they, uh, they are actually um, not, not well aware that this is a safe method and right. they can actually use it as a regular contraceptive as well. I see. So these are the challenges around Bangladesh is going on. Thank you so, for sharing that. Yeah, I think to, to um, increase the accessibility right now and in general, even after the COVID-19, I think uh, to uh, to make available EC to the last mile, sure. and uh, yeah. also um, also removing the service provider bias as well. That promoting the facts that EC is not uh, doesn't cause any sort of uh, complications mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. pregnancies, and it can right. be used as a right. regular contraception. Thank you, Sadia. So it's it's good to hear that there is um, at least somewhat um, decent access to emergency contraception in the in the urban areas especially for married young people but there's obviously still pretty big pretty big gaps um, so now that we've had uh, a bit of a reality check from from Eric and Jackie and Sadia about what it really means to access emergency contraception um, in certain countries and in different communities where for one reason or another, um, access and use is restricted. Um, I want to take us back. Um, if my coworker Sophie or Yasin could show the poll that we took from earlier, 
because we've talked a lot about so far the misconceptions and the uh, questions and so it seems like quite a few of you know that EC is distinct from the other from what people will call the abortion pill um, but not everyone other people a good number almost not quite half and half but a good number agree or disagree about young people using emergency contraception too frequently and of course this is an opinion based um, fact but is likely grounded in some amount of stigma or misconceptions about what is too frequently and what how young people use other forms of contraception. And then the last one um, looks like uh, a good portion of you, 80%, so only two in 10 of you disagreed um, with this, which was that emergency contraception should only be used after experiencing sexual violence. So we've already addressed um, questions, question one and question three, making it clear that emergency contraception is distinct from these other, um, these other uh, methods, but that also emergency contraception should be available to anyone who needs it. So now at this point, um, we can go ahead and close the poll results and talk a little bit about that second point there about young people and the frequency of use and what does that really imply. So a lot of what Sadia, Eric, and Jackie brought up today has, has a lot to do with stigma. And this is where I'm asking that everyone on the line really think about, um, think about um, what does it mean for us, even as family planning and SRHR advocates, to accidentally or on purpose, depending, um, have a stigma um, or a, a perception of young people's use of emergency contraception. I'll give you an example is that I know that even as some of the youth um, advocates that we work with and, and, and also more seasoned advocates will refer to young people as using emergency contraception popping it like candy or using it like candy. And what I'd like to really discuss now is around what is the stigma that's attached to us phrasing it like that and being careful as family planning advocates that we aren't stigmatizing, um, especially young people who use emergency contraception um, for whatever reason they need to. Um, so Tina, I know you've done quite a bit of work around using, um, thinking about the communications and the messaging around emergency contraception. Um, so I wanted to ask you specifically, what are the dangers of framing emergency contraception use this way? Um, and what are some better ways for us to talk about um, the frequency of young people's use of emergency contraception that is not stigmatizing and is a bit more positive and understanding of circumstances. Right. Yeah, I think this framing basically it's in line with what we were saying about punishing women who uh, use EC, and it's kind of um, extrapolating the stigma that uh, like goes around emergency contraception since it was created like four years ago. It's always been surrounded by stigma regarding its mechanism of action, the effect that it's going to have on population, how safe it is. We haven't mentioned that it's a super safe method, that it's always safer to take emergency contraception, uh, an emergency contraceptive pill or two or three in the same cycle. It's always going to be safer than, um, than pregnancy, than unsafe abortion, or than um, childbirth. So I just think that saying that young people pop PCs like candy, it's bringing this stigma to the user. And I think it's needless to say that it's not really useful or helpful one. And I think that um, for the youth advocates that are listening to us here, that um, if you wanna create a campaign or an, uh, an advocacy effort to increase access, to me, the only framework is the human rights framework. And the World Health Organization published in 2014 uh, this document is like a very to the point guideline called Ensuring Human Rights in the Provision of Contraception Information and Services. I recommend it to everyone. 
because it's basically like assuming that having access to information and services and methods of contraception, of regular contraception, including emergency contraception, is our right, is something that we are entitled to. And then our focus should be, should not be, you know, we should not be focusing on counting who takes how many pills in every cycle, but on how affordable is emergency contraception, how accessible, uh, how acceptable the weights provided to young people or to different populations, of what quality it is. In some countries, there has been issues with counterfeit products where you could buy an easy pill that didn't have the, the active ingredient inside. This should be worrying our policymakers and not uh, young people popping uh, easy pills. How, how, you know, the, the, the information that it's out there, how much does it help you? Has it, how much does it help women make informed choices, contraceptive choices? So these are things what should concern us. Emergency contraception is not a silver bullet, it's not the solution to all the problems in the world, it's not the solution to unsafe abortion in the world or to unwanted pregnancies, but, it's a but it's, it should be part of the method mix and it's a reproductive health technology that it's available to us, it's out there for us, it gives us a second chance to, pre to prevent pregnancy and using it should never be considered an act of responsibility, but rather the opposite, I think. That's perfect. I think that that, that last sentence you said of, of really making sure that we flip the narrative to make it clear that it's not irresponsible young people who are using contrac emergency contraception, but rather it's young people who are trying to take control of, of, their, of their futures and really do the responsible thing as best they can. And the, and the safer thing. And the, the safe, thing. yes, exactly. Uh, the, yeah, yeah, the safer thing. thing. Yeah. Do you want to reiterate that point, Tina? So emergency contraception is safer than what? Than pregnancy, especially in contexts like uh, Jacqueline was telling us, like than pregnancy, than abortion or unsafe abortion, and then childbirth. You know, right. taking an over with an with an LNG EC pill, uh, emergency contraception pill, you will never overdose. It's not gonna be toxic into your body. Um, th there is no uh, no harm done at all whatsoever. Any other of the choices, we all know that they might imply more risks. Right. And more challenges so it's always the safer option also exactly okay i hope that that's clear for everyone um who really has been asking some questions in the chat box about the frequency of use um and and really making sure that we um recognize that it's safer for young people to use emergency contraception whenever they need that even if it means repeat use than the alternative of you know, unplanned pregnancy, childbirth, um, safe or unsafe abortion, um, EC is, is a safe method. So the emergency contraception, is, as Sadia was mentioning when she talked about the context in Bangladesh, that it, especially in cities, the perception is that young people use contraception or use emergency contraception very frequently. Um, do we know if this is really true um, and what is the pattern of use of, among young people? Um, Wilson, I think you wanted to give us some background from some of Population Council's research on this. Um, what do we know about young people's pattern of use of, of emergency contraception? Thank you, Emily, for giving me this opportunity to again to discuss uh, on this question. The, the Population Council um, has done a number of studies in many countries to assess the use of um, emergency contraception among young people. Um, re remember, for before you use any product, um, you need information, you need to be aware. It so happens that it's, People, populations in urban areas, because they have access to information, they know where to get EC, they're more likely to access um, EC compared to rural populations. Uh, however, when you look at the DHS, the Demographic Health Survey in many of these countries, in terms of knowledge, you'll find that many people are aware of uh, emergency contraception, but the actual use across the cities and rural areas is, is low. Um, so 
in terms of whether urban uh, young people in urban areas use EC more than the rural folks, I will argue that um, that yes, to some extent, but largely the use of EC across in many of these countries, the actual use is much lower uh, compared to the knowledge. Uh, you'll find 60 to 70 percent of people know about EC, but the actual use is maybe below 10 percent. Um, I only just to emphasize that. Uh, but also the actual use is a good thing. Um, young people require information, they need to know where to get the EC. So using EC is not, let's not look at it from a very negative perspective that uh, using EC, as my colleague has just um, uh, talked about, uh, using EC is a good thing. The young people have the future, they want to complete college, they want to get jobs. They want to be part of the national development. They are future leaders, so they require to define their own path. Um, re remember, um, in, 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 um, if we can put this one in the context, that, um, in terms of well-being, um, in terms of the physical and the emotional well-being, young people want to survive. They want to take care of their lives. Uh, they want to be in charge. So using EC, I think, should be supported. Uh, so that they, they protect themselves. As my colleague said, the alternatives usually was they would drop out of school because of pregnancy or other uh, issues. So the use of EC, I, I, I think they need to get the information and we need to encourage uh, young people to have access to the right information about EC. Over to you, um, Emily. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted myself. Thank you, Wilson, um, for that explanation about even in cases where EC use is high, that is arguably better than um, high rates of, of unplanned pregnancy or, or other unsafe abortion. Um, Jackie, did you want to come in on this about talking about the pattern of young people's use of EC and the concerns about it being too high? Okay, thank you, Emily. Just like what uh, Wilson said, my experience has been that in urban in cities, young people, or uh, the tendency is that their demand is slightly higher than the demand in the rural areas. Should that they will have more information in the urban in urban cities, but the information they have does not necessarily correlate with the demand. Because even in the knowledge that they have, there's uh, still misinformation that level of the cities, and which prevents them from really effectively using ECs as they should. But the the tendency has been I discussed with a few friends, colleagues who are pharmacists who work both in the in the urban cities and rural cities, and they told me that in the urban cities, they noticed that young people were a little bit uh, more, they were bolder to come up and request for an EC in the pharmacy that they were attending to. But in the rural uh, cities, it's a bit not the case. And in the rural cities, most of the times, the person who comes to ask for an EC is generally the male who comes to request of it, maybe because of or strong cultural uh, roots and the values, what people call to be values and the stigma that is around youth and sexuality. So, the, the, to, but to think that there is an overuse is really uh, an experience that I have not had personally because what we're rather struggling with is underuse, which is uh, as a result of misinformation, which is as a result of lack of information and the stigma that comes both from even healthcare providers, because a young person going to ask for, to go, goes to a, a local drugstore to request for an EC and meets an adult who is there. The very first thing the adult will ask the young person is that, who are you requesting this for? And why are you using this? Are you not supposed to be in school? Why, do, why are you having sex now? So it, it, it really shuts them down. So the problem that we have is more of underuse. The problem that we have is more of stigma. The problem that we have is uh, lack of access. Prices that are a bit still too high for for young people to access. Not really that of uh, overuse. Overuse per se. Yeah. I see. 
Could we um, talk a little bit about this idea of overuse? And I, I realize, Jackie, as you're saying, maybe in Cameroon, that's not necessarily um, a challenge per se, but it does seem to be common in some other places and it's coming up a lot in the chat box. Everyone's talking about um, what what is, what's, it's a hard question to answer, but you know, how frequent is too infrequent? What are we really rec What are the recommendations here? Is what's the safety? I know it's a hard question to answer, um, but what's the best we can say at this point based on what we know about the safety of emergency contraception? As Tina mentioned, it's always safer than the alternative, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, but it's coming up a lot in the chat box. I'm afraid we can't ignore it. So if, if anyone can give us um, some, some, point, some points here for everyone to think about, about what does this concept of overuse and the frequency of use, what is, what is really um, behind it? I was, yes, if I may take Yeah, go for it, Tina. Um, I was preparing for this question and wrote you and asked you not to ask it. <laughs> I know, yeah, but with about, about 100 people have asked in the chat box. So. Uh, just disclaimer that I'm going to do my best, but it's a tricky one. But um, basically, there is no number, no specific number that uh, uh, could be, you know, I asked, I asked three very big experts on emergency contraception. Nobody wanted really to give me a number. Um, <clears throat> but the use, the, the regular use of emergency contraception pills with levonorgestrel as an ongoing method has been studied by WHO, the pericoital use that Sadia was mentioning before. It has been studied because it's considered that it could be an effective method for women with low coital frequency. Now, um, uh, uh, in this study, it was um, EC was provided up to six times within a month, um, and and it was effective and safe. Like there were no um, uh, you know no no safety concerns, and it kept uh, postponing ovulation. Now this was one study. It's not at all. This is not a recommendation. It, uh, the consensus is that it needs to, that it ha it's a potential uh, it's a potential uh, contraceptive for for women with low um, frequent uh, sexual intercourse, um, and uh, it might be useful for this kind of population. Uh, this is. I'm not trying to say that it's okay to use the EC pill five you know five times every cycle. First of all, you would. Uh, lose all your money like it's not an effective from the financial point of view in some countries you just cannot do it mm -hmm. if you want to take so many hormones uh, all through a month you might as well take the regular pill in that case so it just doesn't make a lot of sense in, in, um, in a uh, practical way it doesn't in a practical way but it doesn't have it doesn't it, it, there are no safety concerns and no efficacy concerns apparently the efficacy of LNG used this way is similar to that of condoms. Right. Um, so I hope I responded the question I didn't yes, And I apologize for throwing uh, it, Tina, but we couldn't ignore uh, it. I knew, I knew. It was I knew. in the chat box. Yeah, <laughs> I was asking myself, like, if we are asked a number, what's the number? I've never seen it written. It's not written, but this gives us an idea. This gives us an idea, exactly. And, and, and Jackie's made it clear, this is not an official recommendation. She's not a medical provider, but just sharing information with you all um, so that we have a good understanding of, of what really... Um, and just to add that thing. WHO um, states that um, repeat use uh, can be category two for some pe people with certain conditions like liver dysfunction, breast cancer, and, and also WHO generally recommends that uh, repeat use, not frequently repeat, but repeat use of EC indicates that maybe this person could be, should be informed of other choices which are gonna be more effective for her. Also in a pocket wise and at many levels, but not because of the safety. Not because of the safety, but because maybe it's um, more practical for other reasons. Side effects, um, yeah. And yeah. other side effects. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the medical eligibility criteria, that's what Tina is referring to when she says category one versus category two. Um, and category one, as Wilson mentioned in the beginning, is is you know safe and appropriate for 
women and girls of all ages in category two, as Tina said, sometimes means that um, some people who have um, other health issues would need to restrict use for one reason, reason or another. Right. Anyone want to add to that? Okay, I <laughs> know it's a complicated one. So uh, I wanted to point out a little bit more about this um, this point of of what does it mean if if young people? I think it was Jackie. Did you mention that um, EC use is um, the most in demand in Cameroon, even if it's not necessarily the most frequently used at at the time? And what does it really mean about our health services um, and young people's access to information and services if they have to be very reliant on EC, emergency contraception. Or anyone okay. can comment on this. It doesn't have to be Jackie. I'm happy to jump in. Jackie, do you wanna go first? No, it's okay, you can go ahead first, I'll come second. Well, it looks like Eric, you muted yourself. Eric, did you want to say something? Yeah, uh, for my case, uh, just to give a context, the Philippines does not allow young people, minor adolescents below the age of 18, to access uh, contraceptives without uh, presenting a written parental consent in public health facilities. So this limitation would uh, mean that uh, young people would not have, just like what Tina mentioned, uh, they would rather use uh, emergency contraceptive so often uh, in as much as they don't want to, but because they don't have access to the regular, uh, more effective contraceptives, uh, long-acting uh, contraceptives and the like, so they would usually resort to using uh, emergency contraception. And just to add to what Jackie uh, earlier mentioned of the overuse of uh, emergency contraceptive, I was I had once a client who was told that uh, for her not to get pregnant, she has to take a pack of pills uh, for emergency contraception, which eventually, of course, that wouldn't work. And uh, unfortunately, that young girl became pregnant, uh, so she had... Uh, to stop schooling, so basically limiting uh, limit, limiting girls and women of their access, uh, particularly on information and the services, would have, as you mentioned, Emily, earlier, uh, rippled effects on mm -hmm. their lives. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of alluding to something that is not supposed to be used that way in order out of desperation. Yes. Yeah. Does anybody else want to talk about what the what young people's demand or interest in EC perhaps reflects upon health, what it means about health systems and and um, go ahead, Tina. I think well, as um, Eric mentioned, uh, it it means that uh, the information and services provided are poor. Uh, they didn't, that cannot be accessed. They're not accessible. They're not affordable for whatever reason. Are not, they're not responding to young people's needs. But when the use is high or increasing, I think it also means that EC provides women with something they need because we wouldn't be using a lot of something that doesn't respond to our need. It gives us a one-time use method. We use it when we need it. We don't need to take a pill all the day. We don't need to see a doctor. We have control. We go to the pharmacy in many countries, not everywhere. I'm aware, but in many places, we this is totally under our control, and women's control, which is a big plus in a patriarchal world, if we put it into context, um, is discreet, is private, low side effects. So it actually may be a method, you know, it's, um, if we remove it from all the stigma it has, it's a method that responds to the needs of a lot of people. Um, so, so basically, I don't see high use uh, as something necessarily problematic. If it is because they're not given other information and other choices, then it's a problem. But it's, it might be a choice. And, uh, and basically, what we've seen in Europe and recently as a team in University of Maastricht did an analysis of uh, what happens after um, the prescription has been removed, the, the mandatory prescription has been removed. And basically, what happens is that uh, you consume use increases. 
and, uh, and kind of plateaus. It stays. So basically, when you make the drug more available to women, women will use it because it means that, you know, they know they have a check and so choice to prevent pregnancy. They identify when they need to use it, which is a very important point as well for women to know that they might be at risk. There are days in the cycle that you can pretty much guess you're not at risk, but, and they choose to act on it. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing at all. Not necessarily a bad thing, but it is important to then cross check about how comfortable do young people feel going to health clinics and other services to access a wider range of methods. Mm -hmm. um, just wanted to make sure we, uh, this interesting point in the chat box about, um, about there are other ways that have been piloted for making EC use more acceptable. Um, for, for example, in using vending machines, e-commerce commerce platforms, and essentially removing some of the provider bias there, which seems like a really interesting, um, we'd love if, if whoever that is, if you have any, or that's, I think that's uh, Wilson, that's your co coworker. Um, at Population Council, we'd love to share some research on that to, to talk about this a bit more. We only have a little while longer, so I was just hoping we can, um, I've been pulling in some of the points from the, from the Q&A pod into our discussions. A lot of them are about the repeat use question, which we've already covered. Um, but just before we talk a little bit more about um, recommended uh, actions, before we close, I want to also make sure we cover some of these um, questions about, maybe this could be a good question for you, Jackie. It's asking about what is your experience with dispensing EC in community outlets um, or by community health workers or um, they use the word drug peddlers, which I'm assuming is not necessarily someone who has a shop, it's someone who's uh, moves around. I don't know if Jackie wants to talk about that or Wilson, um, but yeah, what is your experience with providing EC in community outlets or with or with community health workers? Okay, so uh, I I think that from my personal experience, young people are more uh, comfortable to go up to to a local drugstore within the neighborhood to request for and easy than to move to a health facility where they have to go through uh, all the procedures before meeting a health or uh, before meeting a general practitioner who prescribe where they can easily go up to to the local drug vendor so they tend to go more to this uh to these drug stores within the community but also uh i've discussed with a few uh, drug vendors who've told me that they have noticed that most of the times these young people will come in a bit late. Some come in, uh, maybe they have already spent more than three days, five days, at times already day 10, and it becomes difficult for them. Uh, the, the, the challenge we have is that normally these drug vendors are not legalized to operate in the territory, but somehow they still manage to operate. So they do not, there is not a good referral system that exists for them to be able to refer these clients to, to the health facilities that have the infrastructure or the, the ability to manage these cases. So they generally tend to maybe assist these ladies to abort if they want to abort or send them home, cancel them and send them home or refer them to somewhere else, which may not really be a legalized facility. So they really request more, young people request uh, EC is more from this from local drug vendors than they will come mm -hmm. to the yeah. facility. They might Most times late. Some of them show up too late. I see. I see. Wilson, did you want to expand on that at all about um, models where EC is dispensed um, yeah. through community outlets or through community health workers? What has been your experience of that? And are young people? Um, you know, able to access more readily that way. Yeah, thank you very much, Emily. For the, I just wanted to say uh, maybe three things. One, young people, when they require is emergency contraception, they want it. Um, they, they don't want to go through cumbersome procedures and all this. So, for our case, for example, in the case of Kenya. 
um, over 95% of ECs are provided through pharmacies or chemists, mm -hmm. other than um, formal health facilities, hospitals, health centers, and dispensaries. Because in the pharmacy, they go there, they ask, uh, they basically go and say, I want emergency contraception. Then the, the pharmacy staff, um, after um, a few interruptions, then they are given without a lot of procedures, we, which we see in the public sector, queuing and um, records and all this. Yeah. So young people don't want to go through very cumbersome procedures. Secondly, the young people don't want to go to a place where providers have judgmental attitude. Um, they want non-judgmental services, very friendly services and, and all these. And we see that a lot in the pharmacy and the chemists. Um, I'm not saying the providers in our hospitals are judgmental. I'm just saying that the, the overall, the younger people find chemists, pharmacies, very, very friendly in terms of uh, getting the service they want. Um, in terms of, and we, we the, the, the pharmacies and the chemists in Kenya, for example, are regulated. They are under the pharmacy and the points of board. They are, they are also available in rural areas, not just urban areas. They are also available in rural areas. So even in rural areas, young people or whoever wants to see can walk to a chemist or pharmacy and get it over the counter. So easing regulatory um, frameworks is, I think to me, is critical. Uh, having these products over the counter, I think this is critical to making um, 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 uh, available, other than in the countries where it's through prescription. Right. Um, so in terms of more... Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yes, no, in, in terms of models, um, y yes, we, we, we're working with some partners where we, we want to pilot um, the provision of EC through EC commerce. Uh, but because we're just about to begin, perhaps I won't comment. I will comment in, if we have a future opportunity again to discuss on such a forum. But, but we, we are doing that. Uh, we, we are doing that to see the feasibility and acceptability of if we can use an EC commerce with one of our partners. Um, so to the question about the community, I would say yes, it's feasible. Is we've, um, we, we, we've, we've seen it work um, over the counter. And I want to, in terms of access, I want to just to mention one thing that EC is expensive. Uh, younger people don't have a lot of money. So uh, um, the reason I'm bringing up this point is to do with repeated use. Yes, in theory, repeated use is a good thing, uh, but remember, if they have had unprotected sex and that they don't have money, they are caught in between um, a rock and a hard place. So sure. I will, for, for, for young people who may wish to have easy repeatedly, I think they can be cancelled so that they get they should be bridged to some long term methods which are overall cheaper because mm -hmm. EC is about two dollars now in the uh, urban areas in some areas maybe one dollar but getting a do a younger person getting a dollar is really I mean you need really to work for it <laughs> it's not readily available yeah over to you Emily thank you so I think that comes to our to actually our, our perfect point of you mentioned something you said was an easing re regulatory frameworks, um, but I think what you mean by that uh, and it is in reference to what you just said, things like making emergency contraception um, less expensive, especially for young people. One of our colleagues um, from Benin mentioned this about. Um, you know, emergency contraception or contraception should be free or is possibly free already in Benin, but young people don't realize this. Um, and what are some of those points that we can recommend to make emergency contraception more uh, accessible and young people can use it as they need to? WHO, as a part of COVID, um, has recommended already that um, emergency contraception and other forms of contraception be accessible without prescription. Um, but are there other things we need to, to recommend at this time? Yes, you know. some, something else that um, I think um, 
we should consider is um, promoting the advanced provision or the advanced prescription for countries where the prescription is still needed, which are not, not that many, I think. Um, but just keeping having emergency contraction at hand, uh, telling people to obtain it uh, before they need it and keeping it at home, because we don't know what's coming up with all this situation. Is There might be a stock out of methods, so having it handy uh, to make sure, because something I don't think we stressed enough is that also another key message is take uh, whatever method uh, you have, pill you have, as soon as possible. The sooner you take it, the more likely you are to um, interfere with the ovulation process and to you know, use EC effectively. Otherwise, if the ovulation process has started, you're not gonna stop it and you're gonna have a pregnancy. So um, in the current context where access to services might be more uh, complicated, or hours of the clinics may be short and so on and so forth. Um, having it at hand is one thing. The timing matters, yeah. Yeah, the timing matters. And then the, the other is like, uh, that it's suggested by FIGO and uh, the, the International Federation of OBGYNs and other, the American Society for Emergency Contraception is to remove medically unnecessary administrative obstacles. So if in Benin, for instance, in Spain also, it is provided free of cost in, if you go to the health facility. Like in Kenya, people, most, although you could get it for free in a health facility, people young and old prefer to go to a pharmacy, not to give too many explanations, not to have it on your record, buy it, take it, solve your problems by yourself. Have a whole conversation, yeah. Yeah, so maybe, you know, the, 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 in, cl in clinical settings, now that a lot of telemedicine is being articulated and organized, also like the minimum checkup can be provided for, um, you know, for the prescription or the indication of VC. So uh, those are some other me measures. When you mentioned the timing, Tina, oh, there's been quite a few questions in the chat box about timing. Um, so some people have asked or proposed that, um, and I'm, you've probably heard this before, that perhaps it should be called the 72 hour pill or that's what they've been calling it in some of their home countries. And they wanna understand um, is can it be taken before um, unprotected sex? And is the 72 hour always the same for the different pills? Oh, yeah, that's Does anyone nice. have a question and answer for that or, or perhaps a resource that they can go to to understand the timing I, better? I can have a, I'll try to address some of these questions quickly. For the new generation of emergency contraception with ulipristal acetate, which uh, also works by uh, inhibiting ovulation. Um, this method has proven to have a sustained efficacy of five days. With levonorgestrel, the postinors and escapels and norlevos and the pills we've been talking about in this webinar, um, the, the product is labeled, the label says that it can be used up to 72 hours, that is three days. And the efficacy has been shown to decrease. So it's more likely that you will stop ovulation on day one and on day two. Also because of a milder timing, because you add more time, you know, you add more time to the equation. So the more days they go by, the more days that you're like, you know, the denominator is higher. Um, uh, 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 ah, and at some point it was the, the off-label use up to five days of the leg when orchestral uh, product was promoted. So like if a woman comes to you on day five, still give her the product because it might work. Now it has been shown that it kind of works until the fourth day, 96 hours, but in the fifth it's very similar to placebo. So, and then the, the, the 72 day peel, the five day peel, I think it's the result which doesn't help as much of marketing campaigns to differentiate the new generation from the old generation. That didn't help the message. <laughs> have the old generation um, pills in their home countries at this point. Yeah, yeah. so maybe they want to, you yeah. Did anyone else want to come in on that? Y yes, the, the, uh, I just wanted to comment on the duration that the, is almost nine to 10 years since WHO revised the guidelines from 72 hours to 120 hours, that's basically five days. But what has happened is that some of the manufacturers, when you look at the information leaflet in the, in, in, in the drug pack, 
or in the in the in the pill a, a pack it talks of 72 hours so it looks like the um, globally i think there needed to have been consensus that the manufacturers also have to follow the evidence uh, if the evidence is saying 120 days and they're talking of 72 days it will tend to confuse the consumers of these products uh, because in the training manuals we talk of five days of course the earlier the better the the if, the, if the EC is used within 24 hours, as Tina mentioned, or earlier, the, the efficacy is as high as 98%. But when you use it within the fourth day or the fifth day, then you, it tapers off, uh, it becomes less effective. Uh, but that needs to be standardized so that we don't um, have a contradiction where the, the information in the, uh, in, the, in the pack is talking of 72 hours or three days and the guidelines, the trainers are talking of five days. I think we need, thank you very much, Tina, for emphasizing that. Thank you. Okay. And so next thing we should invite the manufacturers is what you're telling us to make yes. sure that, that they're correcting their packets. Um, if, I, if I may, may I, may I add something very quickly? Or we'll turn time. No, I, we are pretty much out of time, but, but go for it. Okay, very quickly, because what Wilson pointed, I think it's very important because we all have, uh, uh, th there is so much misconceptions and we're never sure of uh, if we're responding the right response. One problem that we have is that there is, if you really do a thorough research out there, the label of a product may say one thing also about age. We were unable to say up to what age is it okay in, in Europe to use EC. Because the label says one thing, then the national regulatory agency may say, okay, in my country, I'm not going to allow uh, EC pills for women under 16 unless the pharmacies write a report and approve it. So that's the legislation for a specific country. And then WHO, which sets a big uh, umbrella guidance, says that it's okay for all women, women of all ages to use EC, which from the clinical perspective it is. But if you try to make sense of all the information that is out there, you might not make sense of it. And you so, might have a headache <laughs> trying to figure it all out. So this, uh, I think it's an important point. So for, for uh, when advocates start working in their countries, first look at this because you might find discrepancies already and it's not you not understanding it, it's that it doesn't make sense. And, so and I think it gives us an argument to, to, to ask for clarifications and, and change of policy. Sometimes this can be used to our favor. And so if you're confused, you're not alone, um, but there are resources that can help you to figure out how to counsel maybe other young people in your community, how you can help yourself and, and those you love and care about. And we'll be sure, there's been some questions about counseling tools. And so that's something we can be sure to follow up with you all on is um, trying to provide you with some more easily digestible counseling tools. So as we um, close out, I wanted to ask um, everyone to just give some um, recommendations for what we really want to be asking for at this point. Um, you know, I would, I would like to make the request that everyone on the call do their part of, of as a family planning and a SRHR, sexual and reproductive health and rights um, advocate that we do our best to eliminate stigma of emergency contraception use, especially in the way that we talk amongst ourselves and with other young people. Um, I do still very frequently hear us referring to young people using EC like candy, like I mentioned. We need to really flip that narrative that they're taking care of themselves. Uh, some have mentioned flipping it to a narrative around self-care and making sure self this is a form of self-care. Um, and really making sure we're doing our part to eliminate that stigma um, because it starts with us and then it goes, goes outwards. Um, and so that was my first request um, to everyone. If others have concrete recommendations for those on the line, um, looks like the counseling tools would be one thing. Make sure, yes, it's complicated. The manufacturer might what, say one thing, um, then other than the actual WHO recommendations. So do your best to look through counseling guidelines. Prescription should be over the counter. That was something that was already mentioned. Do others have concrete recommendations for things that others should be advocating for? 
I would like to say something very quickly, cool. but um, in the past few years, in countries like the Philippines, where I think the strong Catholic morale is part of the, it's one of the big barriers because, um, because of the understanding that EC could interfere with implantation, and that was a big pro uh, problem. Well, in the last few years, two countries that had similar situations, like Costa Rica and Malta, also highly Catholic and where all this moral side of this reproductive technology uh, had a heavy weight, they had finally managed to change the situation. They have products registered. So I think up to, there was some discussions about to see that could be held they, uh, because it was your opinion against mine. Now there is a lot of evidence supporting um, um, a lot of information about the mechanism of action, the lack of anti-implantatory effect, the fact that it doesn't change, you know, people don't stop using better contraceptive methods if they provide it with information. So I think the past few years there is much more data. So I encourage you all to, you know, to, to organize good campaigns. The International Consortium and of Emergency Contraception and the European Consortium of Emergency Contraception, we kind of keep track of the studies and the data and the experts. So we're here to help if we can with our very humble resources. Help to synthesize some of the data that's out there showing that it doesn't prevent implantation and that um, it is a safe method in that sense. So, there is much more now that we can do, I think. Excellent. Please do, do use some of that data and research to back up um, your points. Mm. Anyone else want to come in with some other concrete recommendations for people on the line in the last few minutes? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Emily. The, 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 I just ha have one recommendation that uh, I think the training in, when we are training providers, um, well, providers, yeah, many, there are many categories of providers. We need to inculcate or integrate the issues of rights of values and attitudes in the training manual so that it, uh, colleagues have the right attitude when they are um, they are coming in contact with these young people who require service. Uh, sometimes we we tend to give them um, non-judgmental, you know, uh, or judgmental kind of um, attitude and all this. That's, that does not help young people at all. So I would recommend strongly that that should be integrated within the curriculum when we are talking of um, effective service, a family plan or, or contraception uh, provision. Mm -hmm. Issues to do with the rights of younger people should be appreciated. Issues to do with our own attitude as providers should be appreciated. Um, and they need, to, they need to change that, it should be appreciated so that we help uh, younger people. Over to you, Emily. Thank you. Excellent. So really looking at things from a rights-based approach and making sure that we're addressing that when we do in-service training or, or out-of-service training um, for all different kinds of healthcare providers. Eric, it looks like you're ready to give us your, your recommendation. Yeah, uh, I've been reading a lot of uh, inputs from the comment, uh, from the chat box and from the Q&A that uh, provider bias is also one of the reasons why young people do not use uh, or access emergency contraceptive or uh, contraceptive in general. So I guess my recommendation as a nurse uh, working in the field of uh, sex and reproductive health and rights is that we must always uh, think of uh, providing the services on a rights-based context. Uh, we must always uh, have in mind that we are doing this following the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child that this is for the best interest of the child or the girl or the young people in general. And as uh, Tina mentioned earlier, uh, providing emergency contraception or providing contraception in general uh, to young women and girls is much less costly than them being uh, pregnant, than them going through uh, unwanted pregnancy or having bad experiences of childbirth and whatnot. And eventually, uh, or see, for example, for the Philippines, or might go or go and have unsafe abortion. So again, uh, at the end of the day, it should be, uh, we, we must provide services for young people and girls, especially on a rights-based context. Exactly, and I think that's where it goes back, back to the conversation of challenging ourselves and those around us with uh, preventing allows us to really operate. Um, having people's rights in mind. 
Jackie, Dr. Jackie. Can you hear me, Jackie? Yeah, so okay. um, my, recommend <laughs> yes, my recommendation will be uh, more in line with data. I think that there's really need for data to be collected at all levels. Because if I am doing advocacy in my community and I'm citing data, maybe that was collected in a community in Nigeria or in Pakistan, the people might not really relate a lot with it. But if I'm doing an advocacy work with uh, heads of NGOs and I'm citing data that is coming from my context, it's easy for people to relate with it. So there's really need for more and more data to be collected on, on the knowledge, on practices. Um, especially young people and emergency contraceptive pills. That's great. So really looking at the data piece and seeing where the gaps are and, and what do we really know about young people's use and, and others' use. Sadia, final thoughts? Well, my final thoughts would be um, governments promoting uh, ECs as much as they are promoting the other methods. Because in Bangladesh, I think uh, till 20, uh, 2008, ECs wasn't included as one of the essential medicines uh, regarding reproductive health. So in Bangladesh, ECs are uh, quite new in terms of other methods of planning or contraceptives. So I think our government should uh, promote it uh, more and also uh, get rid of the service providers' bias and uh, agreeing with other uh, speakers that backing this up with accurate data and, and uh, also the reaching those supplies to the last mile so everyone can access it with uh, uh, the, whenever they want to. So. Great. And so with that, it's really about balancing our, our, our messaging of advocating for young people to have access to all methods. Um, and for us not to be the judges of, of why they might prefer or need one act, one method or over another. Um, I'd like to just ask my coworker Sophie or Yassine to share the, the last slide, which features two resource, um, two resources, um, and we'll be sure to share them in the chat box and also in the follow-up email. Um, so here we have the most recent edition of the FIGO and the ICEC guidance. Um, if you could make that full screen, Sophie, I know you're working on it. And then the second thing is the emergency contraceptive wheel, which is an online tool for counseling. Um, and I'm sure Population Council will share some Populations Council's resources as well. Um, and if you could just hit the full screen, Sophie, so people can do a little screenshot, take a picture on their phones or whatnot um, for now until we send this out. Last but last not least, I'd really like to um, encourage everyone to follow FP2020 um, both on Twitter and on Instagram and use our hashtag, hashtag FP in COVID response. Um, as we mentioned, EC is a special, emergency contraception is especially necessary now um, for everyone, um, especially young people, but we wanna make sure as we, um, at this moment in time, that we really understand um, emergency contraception and break down some of the barriers. So thanks everyone for joining the discussion and helping us to do that today. And we look forward to hearing from you um, going forward. Thanks to our speakers and all our participants. Thank you very much. Thank you.